on the panel tonight, we will have Marisa Larsen, who spoke about Ayurveda, and she's also the organizer of this symposium. Panash Desai, who spoke um, about the one, <laughs> and uh, who is a new thought leader and um, shared very beautifully about his experience. And then uh, we are going to have Dr. Roger Yankee, who spoke about Chinese medicine. And then Jan, uh, Jan Engel Smith, who represented the shamanic tradition in our symposium. So Marisa Larson will be our moderator tonight. And I'd like to invite all the presenters to come to the stage. Let us welcome them. <laughs> This has been quite, for me, a transformational and powerful last nine days. And I feel extraordinary gratitude for the ashram for providing the sacred space to allow this to happen and for creating ongoing opportunities for these sorts of teachings to be spread around the world through each of our voices. And so I really have so much respect for that. And I, I also have so much gratitude for being uh, included in such a wonderful panel. And I also have incredible gratitude to each of these wonderful visionaries and leaders and people who have continuing uh, continued to make uh, throughout their lives and ongoing into, into the future, potentially, incredible differences in the world and each, in, uh, each in our own ways, and yet each of us expressing many of the same things but from different perspectives. So it's been really beautiful to see that play out. So much gratitude for all of your wisdom and insights. So thank you. And so tonight, what we will do is, is we'll begin with each of us offering the takeaway message, the pearl that we, if you don't remember anything else, what do we really want you to go home with? And so we'll each take our terms with that, and then we'll open up for question and answers. So please give thought to what uh, kind of burning questions you might have inside and we'll spend the, m the majority of our time on that because it seems there's been quite a few questions that have come up and we want to uh, be able to air those and w allow you to have voice to those and to see where all of that takes us. So, so I'd like to invite Roger Yonke to begin. Roger Yonke has been speaking on Tai Chi, Qigong. He represents Chinese medicine and that tradition, be offering some beautiful workshops on that. So, thank you, Roger. Uh -huh, that's to me, sorry. Uh, first, 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 just a wave of gratitude to our hosts here and to the beautiful lineage um, that Actually, I have a connection with all the way back into the 1960s. And um, my sense of uh, a great, great takeaway is that we've all been talking about the same thing in the many ways. So that concept of uh, unity in diversity has been very rich this week. Uh, it's been a, r a rich, rich part of my personal destiny and aspiration, and so it's been really a thrill to to be able to speak with these uh, esteemed luminaries, people of the heart, the people for the people, and for the empowerment of all beings, and for peace in the world. So. As the representative of Chinese medicine, uh, I've known all along that Chinese medicine is just one of the great archetypes of an expression of the one medicine. And then as a part of that, that whole concept of the body, the mental emotional self, and the transcendental aspect of being that is in a, a 
a sustained merging with the unity of the cosmos and maybe even the cosmoses. And, and so as Chinese medicine unpacks itself, it's strongly associated with the concept of first, honor the spirit. Second, honor the mental emotional self, cleanse the mental emotional self. And third, to attend to the body. And uh, I've been struck by how we've all been saying that in different ways. And I'll just make one more little comment and then um, maybe we can come back around or however it goes. And that is that in that, in that framework, as we've been discussing it, there's just really one beautiful, not even very, very complex idea and that is to be able to just fall into the arms, surrender into the embrace of our own natural being. That is the being that we are today. That how is it possible that we could be anything other than who we are today in these dimensions and then to be able to just honor that and honor that and honor that and by washing ourselves constantly in that grace and acceptance to evolve in ways that can only be known when those ways arise. So I'll leave it there for now and thank you. I also want to say thank you to all of you for making this such a, a joy-filled, um, extraordinary experience uh, for me to have. And I think my takeaway to you would be that to remember that you are an amazing, divine, extraordinary, magnificent being. And that if you have forgotten that, you can get closer to it with every positive thought you have, every good feeling that you have. Every one of those will take you closer to that. And it will not only heal you, but it will also heal the world. And so stay positive, look for the good in yourself and in everything else. Thank you. Well, um, I'm still in bliss from the chanting. How wonderful was that? Must have been the enchilada, Swamiji. <laughs> that was fantastic. Fantastic. I, uh, I don't really have anything to say. <laughs> I just love you all. And it's my deepest wish that you come to know the love that you are. I hope in some small way this experience has played a part in that. So that's it from me. Wish me luck with the questions. I knew he would be a hard act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> um, goodness. So, <laughs> as we have each said in our own ways, we are divine, we are pure love, we are pure light. And I represent, as you know, the Ayurvedic tradition. And what Ayurveda really brings to the mix is for you to learn how to keep your body in such health and harmony that you become the perfect vessel 
through which that divine energy can flow. Ayurveda is the sister science to yoga. And the two are so intertwined. Ayurveda represents the healing side of yoga, yoga the transformational side of Ayurveda. And what really Ayurveda does is to bring us into that divine alignment that allows us to truly know who we are. It's been doing that since the beginning of time. Chinese medicine has in its way. And what I would encourage is, is that for you to look inside yourself and to decide for you what system, because I want to certainly give a nod to the Chinese medicine as well, uh, either of those can help you in being in that divine alignment so that you are able to be the vessel for knowing yourself, the path to perfect health and the path to enlightenment are parallel paths. And when you bring your, your body into health and balance and harmony, it allows you to be able to know yourself. And there are many ways. I mean, I've taught some programs here, but there's lots out there. And I just encourage you to explore that further, to embrace it, to make it a part of your life for the rest of your life. So thank you. Is there anything else that any of you want to add before we go ahead and open it up? Okay. Roger, you're thinking. You want to? No, no, I'm ready to go. We're ready? Overcome. Okay, thank you. So if we could get the standing microphone, thank you. So feel free in asking questions, and we really encourage you to to ask questions, or we're going to be sitting here twiddling our thumbs. <laughs> um, and so if you have a question, then please go on up to the microphone so that everybody can hear it, and we can even form a, form a line if we need to. Your questions can be directed at any one of us or all of us if you want to know each of our perspective on a particular topic as well. Thank you. So hi, thank you. I was spe specifically asking about last night, but I think it can be a broad question. Um, when you spoke about soul retrieval, and I, I did meet a shaman here about 10 years ago who gave me a, a rattle and some things to use. Do you believe that we can do it ourselves, or we need to have someone trained? And is it something that you believe that we should quit a job to do and to go and to heal that so that we can come back into the world and to do more sort of good? And then the group question would be, can you do more self-healing, or at what point do you need to ask for help? Soul retrieval is happening spontaneously every day. As you raise your internal vibration into a really high frequency, and your soul is a very high frequency, it, it immediately attracts itself back. Where a shaman comes in, in those is in those places that you're really stuck. Where you, you know, are doing the same thing, different places, different faces, but it's the same behavior over and over. Or it's chronic, you can't get over a wound or a, a grief. You have any kind of addiction or a, a chronic illnesses, chronic misfortune, all of those things that would be hard for you to get a handle on because you can't see the forest for the trees. Often you can't see what's going on or be able to really um, go deeply in there to know how to heal it. That's where a shaman will come in and be objective and also have a lot of tools of the trade that know how to get to certain areas where that soul might be lost, caught, captured, whatever the case may be, and be able to retrieve it for you. So as far as, you know, quitting your job and doing something, um, you know, as I was saying last night, I didn't want to do long-term therapy, and so I really would only see a person about three times. And that, that was almost always a full deal that they had recovery in that amount of time. Um, 
on some, ex, you know, it, but, it, you know, if somebody dies or if you get in a car accident, of course, you would want to come back and and address things immediately. In the old days, they did it within three days, you know, and so when things happen, you address it immediately and then you won't have that attachment to it. You won't suffer from it and it'll just be taken care of. So it's not about quitting your job or doing anything like that. Yeah. Did I did I get all the questions? I'm not sure if I answered all the, the three that was specifically around the soul retrieval. Okay. Thank you. And then if I could comment on the other part of your question, which has to do with self-healing, right? And if how appropriate that is. So from the perspective of Ayurveda, ultimately Ayurveda is preventative medicine. That's what it is most profound about. It also addresses things that are more acute and chronic, and yet ultimately what it teaches is, is that if you care for yourselves properly, that you're less likely to become ill. And so, in many regards, it's lifestyle. That's really what Ayurveda teaches, is how to live a healthy lifestyle, to become self-aware, so that you're able to listen to what's going on inside, it provides the tools to know what to do to respond to what our body is telling us and allows your own innate bodily intelligence to be what heals you and keeps you healthy. And then if something goes awry and you do become ill, it can offer a lot for that as well. But certainly the self-healing part has to do with creating healthy, balanced, harmonious lifestyle practices. If things get a little more serious, then visiting your neighborhood uh, Ayurvedic practitioner becomes a good idea, but even then the lifestyle practices need to continue, and sometimes that means under the guidance of somebody who really can direct you. Generally, if you're in a fairly good state of, of balance, no, nothing real dramatic, then you can identify, and maybe you might need help with identifying what Ayurveda calls your doshas, the energies that govern your body. And then, according to, there's lots of sources out there, resources for learning how to keep your vada in balance or your pitta or your kappa. And that can just be an ongoing thing. But if something more serious happens, then you can get more help. So, okay. The most profound medicine <coughs> that has ever been known to the humans is produced within the human system for no cost. Uh, we live in a society that's complaining all the time about the cost of medicine while the most profound medicine is produced within the human system for no cost. So that's kind of a hint about the nature of life. In other words, the humans overall are not very attuned, and we see that. We see that all over the place. And so if the most profound medicine is produced in the human body for no cost, does it make any sense to wait until you've lost your health to use it? Or does it make more sense to use that medicine, turn on that medicine, awaken that medicine, circulate that medicine, and even share that medicine with others as soon as you figure it out, as soon as you know that that's true, then wouldn't that be one of the things that you would want to do every day for the rest of your life? The whole concept then of, well, but where do I get sick? You know, we, we also live in a culture that believes that we have, uh, that the body is the, the, res the residence of the sickness, uh, but all the great indigenous traditions and all the great spiritual traditions will tell you that the sickness in the body is aggravated and sustained over time by the person, 
and the persona of the person and the and the karma of the person of course and the destiny of the person and and the things that look like accidents that may not be accidents so in answer to the question about self care the only tradition of medicine that doesn't suggest self care is the predominant and conventional system of medicine in the modern world which again is a quick reflection on whether the humans are actually evolving or perhaps maybe stalled. So I, I think that for people like ourselves and for those of you who are lucky enough to be participating in the kinds of things that you do here every day, right nourishment, breath practice, making sounds and chanting in a, in, in a, uh, a mood of celebration and hanging around with like-minded people. Wow, I mean, that's the, that's the answer. Um, isn't it odd that so few are singing in that choir, but isn't it a blessing that it is ourselves that to get to be in that choir? Well, you shouldn't quit your job if you like it. So if you're not enjoying your job, then don't suffer now to be happy later. That's the first thing. Second thing is we're moving into an age where your presence alone will restore harmony in the hearts of all that you meet. And that age is quickly coming upon us. Every illness, every disease, every physical manifestation of dissonance is as a result of people forgetting the innate oneness that lives at their core. I had a vision when everything began that people like you would simply walk the earth without saying a word and their light would restore harmony and balance everywhere that they went. That is why you are here, that's why you do your sadhana and that is your future. And so should you leave everything behind in order to do that? I feel like you should do that wherever it makes the biggest impact. And for some of you, that's working in the world. It's working in the most public way possible. It's working in an office building with thousands of people. It's working in a hospital. It's working in densely populated areas. It's taking your light and the reminder that you are to affect mass consciousness. That's the highest form of healing, is to express the harmony that lives within your own heart. Thank you. More questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> Four things. You've warmed up. up. Hiya. Yeah. Um, this is really for Panache. Oh, is it? Good. Yeah. Yay! Uh, you were talking the other night about um, feeling your emotions, and it's really great to feel your emotions. I don't have a problem with that at all. I feel them angry, sad. I'm a real pitter person. My mum used to say I was a volcano, so I erupt all the time, and then I get over it, which is fine. What I, what I find difficult is other people's reactions to my emotions, because I really am. I can be like static electricity, like <laughs> all the time. And other people are like, ah! So uh, how, how can I kind of deal with sort of to not make other people feel my emotions? Because I don't like well, people feeling like that. Actually, you're here to make other people feel uncomfortable. Oh, OK, I do that. Well, <laughs> so I can do that. So when somebody's sad, for example, everyone in the room will rush to that person to avoid looking in the mirror of sadness. When somebody's angry, everyone would judge that person and make them wrong to avoid looking in the mirror of anger. And when somebody's afraid, they'll do the same thing. So, 
other people's reactions to your emotional state is none of your business. Just continue to be the volcanic pitta that you are <laughs> and disrupt reality and the false politeness that we engage in that refuses to look in the mirror of truth and embrace whatever there is to see. You. You're welcome. Also, the other thing is that your emotions don't have to do with anybody else. So when they evoke a response in another person, the only thing that you can activate in another is what is authentically already present in them. So you're doing them a service. You're accelerating their evolution. You should be on Instagram angry. <laughs> we should be broadcasting you on Facebook. Because that's going to help people get over the part of themselves that they have repressed or suppressed or rejected. So don't worry about other people's rea reactions. Just be angry. You're welcome. <laughs> Would you like to share the Ayurvedic perspective? <laughs> you just stated it much better than I could have. <laughs> okay, who's next? <laughs> I have a question. You can go to the microphone. You can go. I have a question. Though. So, as a result of our time together, what is it that has awakened in you? As a result of our time together, what is it that you've remembered? As Boy. a result of our time together, what is it that you will take home, not immediately, but when you finish your teacher training? or for those of you that are here for the we weekend or week, what is it that you get to take home? Because you see, there definitely is a ripple effect. There definitely is a greater, broader manifestation. And so my question to you is, how will you continue on everything that is unfolded here? What does that look like? I already heard from one of you that you were going to start to offer free yoga and that you were going to make everything available to everybody as a result of one of the talks, which made my heart very happy. I would recommend, however, that you do that on Facebook or Instagram or on YouTube so that millions of people can see your offering and your sharing and you can add value to the most amount of human beings that are alive today. By virtue of all of the media that we have available now, you can literally broadcast your authentic beingness around the world and inspire transformation. And so that was one wonderful outcome that I heard from a young man on the dock I was, I was watching the sunset. So thank you for letting me ask my question and answer it. Well, my answer to that question is joy. Um, you really brought great joy. I felt like um, I had come out to play when I came to your workshop in the afternoon, the 2 o'clock workshop. That's what it felt like and felt good. Um, my question, though, has to do, and it's also for you, Panache, um, has to do with just giving more um, insight into the free will yes. um, discussion because there, there's some confusion around that, I think. Yes. And I'd appreciate if you talk more about it. So the reason why the answer is confusing is because it's multidimensional. So just imagine for a moment that there's a building with 33 floors representing the 33 dimensions and beyond. So you take the elevator up to the top floor and if you've had this experience on a plane when you look at planet Earth, it looks so beautiful, everything's so orderly, the cars move like ants. 
the houses are so beautifully organized, everything is so perfect and harmonious. If you were just visiting, and that's the only perspective you had, you would say, wow, what a beautiful planet. Until you came down to the first floor and watched the news. Then all of a sudden you think, what an insane planet. But these are all different vistas of energy and perception. So at the absolute level, your soul is unfolding in absolute perfection in every moment. Just take a breath. This is hard for some of you. On the absolute level, your soul is unfolding in absolute perfection in every moment. However, from the third floor, you have the illusion of turning left or turning right. But ultimately, you are only ever living your soul's agenda. Thank God. That means that your destiny is your destiny. And what a glorious destiny it is to know yourself, to know who you are, to love yourself, to love other people, to be a vessel and a vehicle through which the divine makes itself known in this world. So it's only confusing as long as we argue for some sense of control. Personally, I would rather have no control. And if you think you have control, drink three liters of water and then hold your pee. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Hi guys, um, you're all very beautiful, luminous beings. So this is a kind of devil's advocate question, literally. Uh, both the uh, Seder and uh, the Easter breakfast were very positively charged events where we were uplifted. But then there was this little fly on the windshield, if you will, where there was a soundbite from uh, Marilyn Rossner and the bishop about the devil. <laughs> oh, the devil. So, you know, there's a narrative that the devil is just a metaphorical story for children or adult children. But in terms of the Purusha and the Prakriti, to what extent is there a law of the jungle at work, if you will, of literally dark forces that we could call the devil or demons at work? I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> Thank you. I think the illustration of the building, the 33 floors, is a really great one because it allows you to understand that I call the first floor when we're right here on Earth the densities of the world. They're heavy, and there's a lot of um, uh, duality here, and we learn through the duality. So as far as the devil and, and evil, it exists in certain people's realms. It doesn't have to exist in yours. But if there's a belief system around it and there's action then that follows that, it can become very real and very um, damaging. However, you can always work against that or not even against it but with yourself in not lowering your vibration to that level. The um, work that I've done in uh, 
shamanic work as far as working with people that had those types of possessions, what I was finding was that when we were able to finally move those energies out of the person, they transformed into beyond angelic. Like the greater the uh, darkness was when it finally transformed in the light, it was the most luminous light that you could imagine. I mean, it it made, it, you would only see light in the room visually. It was incredible, and it has been incre incredible every time I've seen it. And so, yes, those realities do exist. Um, as everything else exists, we are in a world of everything. And if it is in, in your imagination, if it is in a thought process, if you can think it, it has become, it's in the consciousness. And so if there is a thing that you can think of, yes, it can be real, it can manifest. As you move up in that building that uh, Banesh was talking about uh, and into the higher dimensions, out of the duality, then it ceases to exist after the fourth dimension into the fifth and sixth. It's only love. And when you have only love, then you don't have duality. That's all there is. But that's not the that's not the training ground. That's not the place where your soul is evolving in those places. It's got different tasks when it's there. And this is your task in this lifetime to understand the duality and make the choices that are going to be different than um, than the choices that will take you down the dark dark path. And I do think that the whoever invented hell had the biggest marketing strategy ever. <laughs> that was that was actual amazing what they did there because so many people bought in bought into the program. So I've never seen it exist in any soul retrieval that I've ever done, in any work that I've ever done with spirit, no matter how dark the forces were, hell never came into the picture. So thank you. And if I could just add one comment to and build on what you were saying is is that again using the metaphor of the multi storied building, when you're in those lower floors how will you know your own light if you don't have something to compare it against? And that's really what the duality does for us. How can you know light without the dark? If you're a candle before the sun, there is, yeah, how are you going to know that? And so it exists for us to know that about ourselves, and then eventually we're able to move up to those higher levels where it ceases. But in the meantime, it serves a purpose. Uh, when I was a younger person, I came from a family that was a Christian family, and they had bought into this great marketing scheme. <coughs> and one of the things that uh, I, l I felt moved by in my own life was to uh, to somehow free myself from that if it was real, or to understand that it was in fact not real. And through a, a whole bunch of amazing experiences, uh, which would include uh, being a teenager and in my 20s in the 1960s, if you can kind of get that picture, um, I pretty quickly was able to prove to myself through experience that the concept of having a a bad and a good was useful for people in a lot of ways. In some ways to just self-sabotage, in other ways to be able to, to sell ways to be free that were based on the illusion that you were not free. And as I investigated the realm of medicines, the all the realms of medicine, I, I originally was uh, going to uh, medical school, and uh, I was seeking a mentor, and I asked a lot of the physicians, you know, 
uh, could you suggest someone as a mentor because I'm very interested in health and the sustaining of health. And what these uh, people would say to me is, uh, oh, well, we don't know anything about health. We're doctors. We just <laughs> diagnose and treat disease. And, <coughs> and I realized that, you know, there's, a, there's, this, there's just a, a real longing for whatever reason in, in the humans, in the kind of conventional human realm, for there to be winners and losers, sick people and well people, rich people and poor people, <coughs> people who have great fortune, people who do not have great fortune. And all of this is uh, rolled out as some sort of a, a real world. And for myself, as, as I got into the, um, the, the Hindu view of life through uh, my, one of my great teachers, Swami Satchitananda, and then through the beautiful Buddhism of India and the Buddhism of China, and then the amazing Taoism of China, which is kind of like the shamanic tradition of, of, of Asia. And all of these left me with the impression that there is just light only one light. Many candles, one light. And that the concept of the devil or the concept of sickness or the concept of misfortune are all there as gradients of light. And that their primary presence in the world is to offer contrast. Contrast as a learning instrument, but also contrast as a trap. And as people, as people like yourselves use the nourishment and the body practices, the asanas and the pranayamas, and the celebrations and the making of sounds to vibrate the body, to open, to open ourselves to the presence of that kind of ultimate truth, shall we say, that we learn, we through experience learn, generate wisdom about what contrast is for. And as naive, children trained by people who hardly knew what they were doing. You know, in most cultures, they do not allow the parents to raise the children. The children are raised by older people who have more insight. As we become older people and gain more and more wisdom, we realize that contrast is not there as a trap, but as a, a version of contrast that lets us feel into the fact that there cannot be anything wrong. So one of my favorite lines for my worst days is, this moment is the pinnacle of your spiritual evolution. The worst days. On the best days, I'm too busy having fun to care. I have no comment on the devil. Now you're going to make me answer the question. Okay. I'll try. Um... So if I'm not mistaken, the devil was God's most beloved angel. His job was to test humanity's faith in God. It's not his fault that humans didn't have complete faith and trust in God. As a result of this, he got a bad reputation. Because it's easier to blame him than it is to look at one's level of accountability and responsibility as it relates to one's faith and trust in the Most High. I 
I hope that helps. I haven't met a devil that I haven't loved so far. It's all a distortion in human perception. But the truth is, as Roger so eloquently said, there's just light. So I hope that helps. Um, oh. I'm quite ner nervous about asking my question, so bear with me here. Um, just going back to the anger thing that that you answered, uh, the answer that you gave didn't really sit right with me. I too have been dealing and looking into anger for a long time within myself and and the repercussions and and um, I feel like saying, oh well, you're here to shake things up is kind of giving people a carte blanche to just behave any way they want to behave because um, they're here to shake things up. Um, you know, I used to take that on as well, you know, being the one that's here to, you know, cause waves and kalima and all this stuff. And and I realized that um, it's actu it's been actually really destructive. And yeah. um, when I did my first Panchakarma in India about 15 years ago, I used to always think that I was an angry person. I was a hot-headed pitta person. And in my PK experience, when they did the Varechna, um, I, for the first time in my life, saw that these doshic imbalances, you know, like move out of my being, move out of my mind and my body. And I had a very cool, calm, collected, beautiful, wow. I was like, wow, I am so cool as a cucumber here. And I realized that, you know, this anger, this, this isn't me. It's, it's just like different imbalances happening in me. And I can choose what to do with this. I, I, you know, it's one thing to feel this anger, but to just like make other people feel uncomfortable around you. And then what happens? They don't want to be around you anymore. And then you start feeling bad about yourself. And I kind of saw in the body language when you were like, oh, well, just be angry. Um, the person who was a asking the question, just go like, yeah, like I don't have to, I don't have to deal with it. I don't have to change. I can, you know, and I'm just conveying this because I've also gone through like a, a lot of dealings with this. So I, I just, I don't know if it's really a question. Well, I like the question I because first of all, I appreciate the fact that anger has been such a source of suffering for you. Anger has been a source of suffering you to the degree to which you've judged it or repressed it or denied it. So to, no. not once did I say to go and act out your anger on other people. Because it's not about anyone else. But that being said, it is okay to be angry. Yeah, it's okay to feel anger. But right. To, like so, but that's okay. And then just feeling your anger then naturally provides people an opportunity to access their own. That's all I'm saying. Okay, so maybe I misunderstood what I you think were you completely misunderstood. Trying to say there. But that's okay. Okay. But and and the thing is that, you know, people completely judge themselves. If we had no label of anger and no judgment around that emotional state, would there ever be a problem? Well, anger seems to it is a destructive force. So yeah. Only when it's directed at somebody and mm -hmm. only when you think in some way, shape or form that it's about something or someone outside of you. You see, in spirituality, we're of the belief that we should be getting rid of things or that things are wrong or bad in some way. I don't think that things are wrong or bad. I just mm -hmm. think that we can be the master of what is happening well, within us. And good luck we with that. Well, it's been, I've seen the masters be able to do that. So I have faith that that is possible, that we but can. But that happens through cultivating an inclusiveness around all things. Or having an awareness that you're not there. I mean, you're not that. You know, I'm not an angry person. Mm, I'm not, no. I, I have. You're not an angry person, but yet you still experience anger. Yes, exactly. So it's that okay. disidentification, you know, instead of, I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I should just shut up. But no, no, you shouldn't. No, you shouldn't. No. 
it's important that you understand. So if we were taught as children that it was okay to feel everything that, that we were feeling as human beings, there would never be a problem. But the issue is that we're judged for feeling certain feelings because certain feelings are societally unacceptable. So for example, when you're experiencing anger, it's not socially acceptable. So people make you wrong. Well, it's the same thing with sadness. It's the same thing with everything. So then people live a monotone life thinking that, well, they're just supposed to be happy then. But the only problem is that then you've created a hierarchy of emotional experience and you're setting yourself up for misery. So every being on this planet experiences some form of anger at some point. It's just that in fully experiencing it, we don't then have to act it out on other people. And then we break the cycle of the unconscious processing of emotion. It just ends. Because we just something triggers it, we experience it, we feel it inside of us, and then that's the end of it. And the more we do that, the more we start to break the unconscious patterning that we have. See? It's a very powerful energy. It's very powerful. You see, you feel bad because of what you think you've done to hurt people because of that energy. I just feel like anger itself hurts you. It doesn't lend to peace. Exactly. It doesn't... But that's why when it arises, the only way to return to peace is to welcome it. You see, yes, that I understand. You see, yeah. Because if you want to be free, then you have to cultivate the attitude that everything is welcome here. That's honest. Everything is welcome here. That's something that you can cultivate with yourself. Everything is welcome here. It doesn't mean it has to dominate me. It doesn't mean that it has to take control of me. It doesn't mean that it has to run me, but it at least has to be welcome. The guest and the visitor at least has to be welcome in the house. Oh yeah, I allow, I allow, <laughs> it's, yeah. Can right? It, does anyone else have? Yeah, sure. Does that make sense though, yeah. from my perspective? Because that was, yeah, I think I just sort of misunderstood what you were saying to... Because we have a complete misunderstanding around emotion in general, especially anger. Because anger's only ever been modeled unconsciously to us. It's only ever been modeled unconsciously. It's never been modeled consciously. And that's why we have such a hard time with that emotion, because it's such a powerful emotion. It's a powerful emotion. But to me, there's no difference between anger and joy. They're just blips. It's just for most people, anger is a bigger blip in the experience of peace because it has more of a power to it, more of an energy to it than most other things. So with that, I'll hand off to people who have way more years on this earth and a depth of understanding that is way beyond mine. I hope that helps. Thank you. I, I'd like to jump in just b briefly on this one. You know, uh, anger as expressed in, in an aggressive or explosive sort of way is a reaction. And as someone becomes conscious enough, perhaps even as conscious as the person who was just asking the question, then they begin to ask themselves how and why this is happening. Maybe they get some help from someone called a counselor, or maybe it's even just a yoga teacher or a massage therapist or a friend. And over time, people who cultivate themselves become aware of the difference between reaction and that whole concept of being responsive. Reaction is sudden and responsiveness is more thoughtful. And in the tradition that I'm familiar with uh, from the point of view of uh, Chinese spirituality, Chinese medicine, uh, Chinese yoga, there's a there's a there's a concept of of what's called the heart mind the heart mind and the heart and the mind in the Chinese language are, are one thing 
So intelligence and feeling. When intelligence or what we might call attitudes, concepts, and intellect merge in a meaningful, cons considered way with feeling. There's even a phrase that says, and now, and this is a classic phrase from the Native American side of things too, the phrase is, and now the heart and mind are one. And when the heart and mind have been cultivated in such a way to resonate in a, in a unified way, explosive anger is impossible. Like Panache was just saying, there's n never, n anger is never modeled in a conscious way. Anger is always just expressed and we see it as explosive. And when it's considered, when it's, when it's a part of a cultivated person's responsive way of being, it, it doesn't show up like anger. It's 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 something else. It's 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 a kind of awareness. That's beautiful because the truth is, in the absence of anger, there would be most art that's come into being. In the absence of that energy, that art wouldn't have come into creation. Same thing with music. So what we have to do is use our creative ability to express that energy in whatever way we're in harmony with it, you see? So for example, just imagine if there was no anger, would we ever have heavy metal? <laughs> if there was no anger, would we ever have rap music? <coughs> now, if there was no anger, would we ever have social transformation and change in any meaningful way? So it's not the emotion, it's not the energy, it's what we do with it. It's what we do with it. Because the more we are welcoming of that guest, the more it flows through. It basically erupts in the body like a volcano. It's a wonderful feeling. It erupts, starts to move through the body. Sometimes your face goes red and it comes, smoke comes out of your ears, leaves the top of your head, and it's finished. But when you act on it, then you end up running some people over. I always use this analogy, you know, in the, in the UK we learn how to drive on stick shifts. If the car's in neutral, nobody gets run over. You can run the engine as much as you want. You can rev it until the wheels are spinning. You can rev that. But if there's no gear, if there's no direction, if there's nothing to direct that energy toward, then nobody's harmed, including you. So I'm personally grateful for that energy because so much art and creativity and social change has come into being because people have chosen to consciously express it instead of unconsciously act it out in a distorted way in the world around them. I hope that helps. So basically, no anger, no punk rock. <laughs> I'm going to give a little bit of a different perspective. <laughs> From a shamanic perspective, um, Anger is what causes illness in the body, it is, or any of the lower frequency energies. You have basically two energies in a dualistic condition in which we're in. You have love, which is a high frequency energy, and all the things that would be in alignment with that. And you have fear at the other end, and all the things that would be in alignment with that. And you are a high frequency system. You're made of the divine and when you have that divine energy and you intrude it with a lower frequency energy, it causes an, a misalignment inside the body and it makes illness be present, present like a dis-ease in the body. And so the spirits will s often say, you know, yes, we have all these emotions. We're the planet of emotion. We, they, they talk about how we're here to learn about emotion. It's the only place really in the universe that this is expressed. And it's a, it's a vital part of how we create. We create through our emotions. And that because there is this range, you know, feel something three times, and then after three times you're attached to it, and that's that's the difference. The attachment 
is then what makes you ill. And you can it can be the same um, it, for any emotion. It's to not become attached to them, but to realize that the lower frequency emotions are what age you, are what eventually hurt you and damage you and all the diseases, all the illnesses that we are known on, uh, to man are a form of a low frequency energy from that realm that is caught in a divine system and you're the divine system. So that's a shamanic perspective of it. And I just want to make one comment and then I think we'll wrap it up at that. It's starting to get late. So, oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, so we'll take your question and I'll just make my comment, thank you. So my comment actually has to do with a concept that um, she mentioned that many of you may not have known what she was referring to in that question was she mentioned Panchakarma. And Panchakarma, for those of you who are not familiar with that, are the deepest cleansing and rejuvenation practices of Ayurveda. Very deep and very profound. And what is really significant about that is that when you undergo Panchakarma, in essence it peels away layers of your ego, it peels away that uh, part of you that needs shedding in order to reveal who you really are, in order to reveal the divine within. And she kind of expressed that a bit in her own experience of it. But I wanted to mention that for those of you that can benefit, actually, pretty much everyone can benefit from that. And it is a really profound way of kickstarting, of sort of catapulting us quickly into this place of divine awareness because it just helps to peel away the layers that prevent us from knowing that on all layers of cleaning out bodily toxins, mental emotional toxicity, and revealing our, our truest self. So thank you. And go ahead and we'll take your question. Om, um, I think it will be brief. Um, first, I want to thank my fellow goddess for inviting in the clarification about the identification with our emotions. Mm -hmm. And thank you all for being here this weekend. This is a wonderful symposium. I'd like to ask you all to briefly speak to your humanness for a moment and experience as students um, at any point. And um, I know we're running out of time, but share with us all, each of you, a teacher you've had in your lives whose name we would not recognize. Teachers come in all forms. Some teachers who claim they are teachers don't teach much. Some people who do not claim to be teachers teach a whole lot. And so if you could share that with us briefly, that's what I was wanting to ask. Um. You're speaking of human teachers, is that correct, not spirit teachers? I said you're speaking of human beings, not spirits, as the greatest teachers. Okay. For myself, I think my greatest teacher in my life is my husband. His name's Ed. <laughs> you wouldn't know him, but you have seen him here, possibly. When I s look at that man, I look at somebody that expresses unconditional love in almost every instance in his life. I've rarely ever seen him not express it. And through that, I have learned about being a good human being because I've had my own personal role model throughout my life with him for 35 years. <laughs> so that's my greatest teacher. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm going to mention two, uh, only very briefly. One is named Clara, and Clara is my grandmother <coughs> who, while my parents were young people who had very little wisdom <laughs> in their own lives and, and certainly were not able to pass much wisdom on to me, though they were loving people. Um, my grandmother was, uh, I think she's a bona fide 
mystic, really. And she was the one, I mentioned her the other night, she took me to the Catholic Church and just blew my mind with these rituals that uh, I wasn't old enough to realize how complex the church was. I was just having the experience of the presence of spirit and uh, it was um, just amazing. And the probably the strongest teaching for all of her spirituality was her human humility. She was a courageous uh, person who was not particularly well educated and was not particularly well off. And 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 yet she had the she had the she had a mighty mighty spirit. And and then the other one is my my wife, Rebecca, and I recently had my 70th birthday, and as a part of my 70th birthday, we had a family gathering, and at our family gathering, we had one of those circles, you know, where you just say cool stuff about the people that you know. <laughs> and <coughs> I, I was really, really honored with everything that my kids said and my, my sister and so forth. Um, but when my wife said what she said, it was it was like it was like talking to a transcendental being. I mean, she just went, and we have like a pretty mundane life and have a lot of things that we don't particularly agree on. But when she spoke, it just went straight into my heart and then beyond. It was a well, it was a shakti. It was a Shakti moment. Well, uh, my teacher seems to switch bodies. Um, and there are moments where the wisdom comes from everybody. And I would like to leave you with that because I feel like in every moment, everybody has the capacity to be our teacher and to offer us something. And when we really understand what this life is about, it becomes easier to recognize that. Because in one moment, it can be my daughter Celeste, who's just happy and courageous after a heart transplant. In the next moment, it's my cat, who seems to have the best life in my house. He just lays around on all the nice furniture and sneezes wherever he pleases. <laughs> uh, and then in the next moment, it's my mother or one of the people that are um, my staff or somebody that comes to see me. So my teacher seems to jump into different bodies to share with me whatever needs to be shared in that moment. And I'm so grateful for that because in being here with all of you, so many of you have played that part for me. And I can't thank you enough because I can't wait to get home because I don't know what's going to happen. I'm so excited. I'm serious. And that's because... My teacher picks incredible bodies to communicate through. And so don't pigeonhole where wisdom comes from. Just be open. Someone in the post office said something to me once that was just profound. Never met the person in my life. I have random conversations on planes with strangers that are just amazing. So. Your teacher is God, and God uses everything and everyone to further your evolution. So thank you. And thank you to my cat for sneezing on all my furniture. <laughs> thank you. That was beautiful. And again, a hard one to top. <laughs> but I will say what he said and what she said and what he said, and my mommy. <laughs> my mommy has been a rock throughout my whole life and a source of unconditional love and a guiding light and always there for me. And I will always cherish that. And all the other forces, uh, faces, I should say, uh, of all the teachers. So thank you all so much. This has been such an amazing, wonderful experience. I hope you've all benefited and have some pearls to take home with you. 
Thank you all so very much. Om Namah Shivaya.